On today's episode of What's Going On With Shipping, Sea Lift and the Spanish-American War. Hi, I'm your host, Sal Mercagalano. Welcome to today's episode. So I've been wanting to do a series on military sea lift. This is the civilian application of commercial ships to warfare for a long time. And I figured Veterans Day 2022, it's a great time to start this series. And I'm going to start the series where I started my research. My doctoral dissertation covers military sea lift from the Spanish-American War up into the Iraq War of 2003. And I figured I'm going to follow the same exact format. So today we're going to start with the Spanish-American War of 1898. These are going to be quick little series. Talk about them. Can't go into all the detail I would ever want to, but just enough to kind of whet your appetite on the role that the commercial merchant marine played in these conflicts. If you're new to the channel, take a second, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's jump into this. So this conflict kicks off in Havana Harbor in February of 1898 with the destruction of the U.S. battleship Maine. The destruction of the Maine is the cause for war, Casai Belli, that the Americans use, even though it becomes very clear long after that the Maine blew up because of an internal explosion native to the vessel. It wasn't due to a mine, but this had to do a lot with yellow journalism, the idea that the Spanish were the evil ones that did this. And much like we see today, uh, mainstream media can try to drive the narrative and politicians will use an event for their political benefit. And that's what we see happen here. The U.S. finds itself involved in a war with Spain. And fortunately, we picked the one country, in, probably in the world, especially in Europe, that we could handle militarily at the time because the U.S. was in pretty bad shape in 1898 when it came to military power. After the Civil War, where we were probably the most powerful nation in the world, we let our military really decline. The Army, and particularly the Navy, declined in this. But the Spanish-American War is going to be a much different conflict because this is going to be a global war. We're going to see war being fought on a global scale. We're going to be fighting in the Caribbean over Cuba and Puerto Rico. We're going to be in the Pacific fighting in the Philippines, but also obtaining islands like Guam and the Hawaiian Republic. So this will put the United States on a massive world stage. And principally, the Navy at this time is a fairly small Navy. Now, it's going to grow during the Spanish-American War, largely through the influx of a lot of commercial ships that are going to be brought in. But prior to 1898, the U.S. Navy was really a kind of constabulary force. And it was more protection, protection for U.S. shipping abroad. We had overseas squadrons with cruisers and gunboats, but really we could not go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any Navy in the world. Now that changes in the late 1800s, 1880s into the 1890s. We start seeing a renaissance in U.S. naval shipbuilding. We build the first battleships. Maine was one of those examples. But we have a whole batch of other battleships and cruisers that are coming online here. And so this is going to be a big test for the U.S. Navy and also the U.S. commercial merchant marine because we're not just going to be fighting a naval battles. We're not just fighting the Battle of Manila Bay, the Battle of Santiago, but we're going to need to deploy troops and forces around the world. And that's going to mean troop ships, which we don't have. That's going to mean commercial shipping being used. That means supplies. It means logistics. And all of that is going to be in kind of symbiosis between the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Commercial Merchant Marine. Now, fortunately, prior to the war, the U.S. started the process of ensuring that we had some commercial vessels that, in case of war, could be brought into the military. And this came through the Postal Act or Postal Mail Act of 1891. It's one of the very first instances we see where the U.S. decides to provide some cash incentives to shipbuilders to build vessels. In this case, it's mail contracts. Mail is the way information is spread around the world. Yes, you have undersea cable, but it's very expensive and also very slow. The bulk of mail goes by ocean. And 13 vessels obtain these contracts. They obtain contracts to move the U.S. mail, they're given priority choice here, but they also have a provision where, in case of war, the U.S. military can obtain these vessels and use them. Now, in both cases, the Navy and the Army want these vessels. The Army wants these vessels as troop ships. They're, they're ideal for troop ships. Matter of fact, four of them, St. Louis, St. Paul, Yale, and Harvard, will become troop ships, but during World War I, not the Spanish-American War. Instead, the Navy beats the Army to the punch and requisitions these vessels as auxiliary cruisers. 
Now, an auxiliary cruiser is not meant to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with an enemy cruiser. That's not what it's designed to do. It's designed to perform the roles of a cruiser. That's basically long-range scouting and reconnaissance. And so what the U.S. does is outfit these vessels. They can steam long distances because of their cargo capacity. They station them in key waterway choke points to monitor the Spanish Navy and observe them. But that means the vessels are denied the role of being troop ships, which means the U.S. Army is going to have to find troop ships from another source, which they do. They start chartering vessels from the commercial merchant marine, largely cargo vessels that now have to be retrofitted to handle troops on board. That means the outfitting of bunks, that means the outfitting of kitchens, and it also means the outfitting of bathroom facilities, heads and uh, lavatories on board. The site chosen for embarkation of U.S. troops is two. One is Tampa, the other is San Francisco. San Francisco will be used to deploy troops across the Pacific to Hawaii, to Guam, but most importantly to the Philippines. Tampa is chosen, uh, San Francisco on the West Coast, Tampa on the East Coast. Tampa is chosen. It's not the ideal choice. Tampa is not a massive port. It's chosen because of its proximity to Havana, because the initial perceived nature of the war is we're going to embark 5,000 troops, land in Havana, capture the capital of Cuba. That's the end of the war. However, plans change. Instead, those troops are not going to Havana. They're going to Santiago on the southern coast of Cuba because that's where Admiral Severa's squadron sails from Spain to Santiago and becomes the focal point, the objective for this force. The force also grows from 5,000 troops to 25,000 troops. And so Tampa becomes the receiving area. It has a rail line that comes into it, has a large wharf facility down there, and an enclosed kind of canal system there where the ships can moor. And this image really kind of captures the image there. Now, understand, this is the first time the U.S. is embarking an overseas military expedition really since the Mexican-American War of 1846, when we land Scott's army in 1847. Uh, yeah, we do some amphibious movements during the Civil War, but nothing on the distance and scale of this. This is pretty massive. And if you read a lot of the literature about this event, it's chaos. It, it's chaos in the port of Tampa, uh, the embarkation of troops, uh, all of this is. But just to give you an idea here why this, this is depicted like this, uh, these troop ships, again, are not troop ships, they're cargo ships with some passenger facilities on board, but you're turning cargo holds into bunk space. And these vessels have very rudimentary facilities. Again, when you're thinking about sailing from Tampa to Havana, that's a couple of days. When you're thinking about sailing from Tampa to Santiago, that's a week. And more importantly, when the troops are eventually embarked on these vessels, they sit there for a week or two in Tampa, South Florida, in summertime, on, in wool uniforms. It's miserable. Oh, and by the way, you dock these ships, not just up and down this key, as you see here, but also outboard of these vessels. So you have two to three vessels moored outboard in this canal. And the facilities, the bathroom facilities, the latrines, the lavatories, the heads, they just pump directly overboard. And so the canal becomes a sewer in summertime in Florida. It's, it's miserable. There's no air ventilation on these vessels. So it's one of the reasons why when you read accounts of this, for example, Teddy Roosevelt in his Rough Riders book, he talks about the Yucatan, the vessel depicted there. And he talks about the Yucatan being akin to the black hole of Calcutta, the prison that Westerners were sentenced to by the Indians. And that's because the Yucatan was sitting there for weeks with the Rough Riders embarked in miserable conditions. They should never have been embarked until the ships were ready to sail. And if they were not ready to sail, they should have sent the ships out to anchor so that they can get wind at least and, and not have vessels slammed up against them. And the waste could at least go into the open ocean, not into a canal system. But understand, Teddy Roosevelt, I want to be careful about it. He, he doesn't lie, but man, does he exaggerate. And one of the things he exaggerates about is the Rough Riders obtaining the Yucatan. If you read the passage from Rough Riders, he talks about how he had to beat a New York regiment, the 71st New York, and the, uh, the, the, the second infantry to get down there. And he talks about how his men got down to the port, 
barricaded the, the, the gangway and prevented these units from loading on board, is, it, it comes out of Teddy Roosevelt's own imagination. I, I can't say anything more about it. After the war, there's an event called the Dodge Commission. The Dodge Commission was created to investigate the war. And one of the, the uh, people who testified in the Dodge Commission was a ship captain from the plant line. Plant line sailed out of Tampa, operated along the Gulf Coast of the United States. And this ship captain testified that he was hired by the, the, the quartermaster in charge of embarking all the troops in Tampa. And he was asked specifically about Teddy Roosevelt's story about seizing the vessel. And he said, no, it's not true. He produced the sheet he had that showed what vessels went to what troops. And the Rough Riders were supposed to go on the Yucatan. He said there was no need to seize a vessel when that was the vessel they were going upon. He said that the reason there was such chaos and pandemonium is because most of these troops had never been involved in military logistics operation before because most of them never been on a ship before and so what they saw was chaos was the orchestrated logistics that was going on down there now there was chaos there was a lot of of confusion there's no doubt but it wasn't as out of control as sometimes depicted in the literature talking about this now the amphibious landing in cuba was that was crazy that was out of control a lot of the barges and tugs and lighterage that were booked to do this never appeared uh, or were, was, was, was delayed in getting down there. So that a lot of the, sh the way the troops landed at Daiquiri, which is where the, the landing took place in the southern shore of Cuba, had to be done by ship's boats. And when Roosevelt talks about the fact that his horse, Little Texas, had to be basically thrown into the water off the Yucatan and swim ashore, that is accurate. That is true because the landing ashore was not done in a really coherent manner. Now, what's interesting is you compare the transportation of troops to Cuba versus that to the Philippines, and you get a much different story. Because of the distance involved going across the Pacific, the ships that are chartered were much better for that voyage. They were larger. They had passenger facilities already. They had to supplement them but you had to make provisions for the troops for the long distance voyage. Whereas Cuba was done on a short notice and the initial plan was a short distance and a short, a short period they would be embarked. And it wound up not being that way. And what became very clear during these operations is after the successful landing in Daiquiri with the Fifth Corps in Cuba and then the successful landing of troops in the Philippines, was you can't count on chartering ships to do this. What was needed was a dedicated pool of ships to handle this because commercial ships were not going to be able to do this. The commercial ships that were obtained for the landings in Cuba and even the ones for the Philippines need to go back on their commercial service. They were a band-aid fix to the problem. So you create something called the Army Transport Service in 1898. And the Army Transport Service basically bought ships on the open market. They bought a, a fleet of vessels from a, an outfit called the Atlantic Transport Company, which was operating actually under the British flag. They bought these vessels, brought them into the U.S. service, reflagged them, brought them in uh, and crewed them with civilian merchant mariners, but under the command of the Army Transportation Service. A brigadier general or colonel would oversee the Army Transport Service. You brought these vessels in, you converted them, initially kind of moderate conversions, but later on they went back in for much more extreme conversions. And these vessels became the basis for supporting the U.S. military, not just the Army, but Navy and Marines actually overseas for the next 20 years. The ships were renamed for Civil War generals, so you get ships like the Meade, the Sherman, the Grant, the Hancock, uh, all of them, and they became just absolutely the basis by which we supported troop movements to Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Philippines for the Boxer Rebellion, for the Philippine-American War of 1899 to 1903. And matter of fact, you move huge amounts of troops. If you look at the number of troops moved by this force, it's impressive. It's an impressive array. You can identify the vessels by their gray stacks with the red, white, and blue stripes on, on, on the stacks. 
very common. And, and these vessels and the rules that were created in how to operate these vessels became the basis for how we operate vessels during the First World War. On the Navy side, the Navy needs now to supply this fleet and these, these overseas squadrons in a much better way. They can't depend on getting coal from the British, for example, because once you go to war against Spain, you can't get any more supplies from them. So we had to ship coal all the way from the United States out to the Philippines. And remember, the Panama Canal is not open until 1914. So you're talking about from the east coast of the United States, across the Atlantic, through the Med, through the Suez, across the Indian Ocean to the Philippines. And the Navy took over a fleet of vessels that became Navy Colliers. But what was really interesting was some of these vessels were converted over to commercial use or commercial crewing. This is USS Alexander, the first vessel of what becomes the Navy Collier Service. Later on, it was renamed in 1905 the Navy Auxiliary Service. A civilian master was hired by the Department of Navy. He was asked to crew this vessel, find a crew for this vessel. Initially, it was the Alexander and five vessels. Later, it's over two dozen vessels that are taken over. You can identify them by the uh, straw color stripe here, this yellow goldish stripe on the stack. And these vessels would deploy coal to advanced bases in the United States on the West Coast in California in Hawaii and at Cavite in the Philippines. When the Great White Fleet goes around the world, which is I'm going to look at next here, is the, the logistics for the Great White Fleet, is it's going to draw upon a lot of the coal that's stored here and prepositioned by the vessels of the Navy Auxiliary Service or the Navy Collier Sir or the Collier Service prior to that. So in many ways, what you see used for sea lift today, the use of commercial shipping, the idea of government-owned shipping with civilian crews on board, like the Army Transport Service, or the support of Navy vessels in forward areas through colliers and logistics through the Navy Collier Service or the uh, Navy Auxiliary Service, all of that has its roots right here during the sea lift operation for the Spanish-American War. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did enjoy the video, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, give it a thumbs up, share it across social media, and if you can, support the channel. How do you do that? Well, you can hit that super thanks button below, which allows you to contribute directly to the page, or head on over to Patreon. You'll see a link for it at the end of the video. You can become a monthly or yearly patron of the channel. That helps me put this channel together for you. Until our next video, this is Sal signing off. Happy Veterans Day.